sometimes a little on the hokey side, but we definitely want something encouraging. And so First Peter chapter 1, it is. Um, you'll notice the first two verses have a lot of encouragement in mind. So we're in the right book here. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Binth- Bithynia, uh, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. So, in terms of well-wishing, I want somebody to wish this for me. Grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. Yes, please. So, the whole, the whole subject of chapter 1 is instructions to that end. Grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Um, and that's, that's uh, after just a, a really wonderful inter- introduction here of these, the value that these people hold in Jesus, that they are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father uh, in the sanctifying work of the Spirit, and that they were chosen for a purpose, to obey Jesus and be sprinkled with his blood, just like the Old Testament altar was sprinkled, that this is a purifying kind of image, sprinkled by his blood for the purpose of obeying um, Grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. In terms of traditions, um, we have plenty of bad traditions, but I think one of the good traditions that we still hold on to in in our culture is to sort of hype ourselves up for the new year. We're looking back at the old year. What were some of the wins? What were some of the losses? Um, Anna gave me a chance to get out of the house and get some alone time and sort of review those things for myself yesterday. And... I think it's really neat that in a culture that's so obsessed with sort of victimhood and looking at, you know, how life is unfair to us that we actually have a tradition of being resolute about the future. Here's here's where my life is messed up and here's what I'm going to change about it for the next year. Um, There was a video going around around finals week for college students on the internet and it was these students and they were sort of in this big complex, you know, I think maybe 10 story buildings, there were dorms and there was about four or five of them. And people were going out on their porch at midnight to, uh, during finals week to scream, like just, just vent and scream. And so this video is just this cry of human misery (laughs) going up to the heavens. And I feel really bad for the kid that didn't get the memo and just wakes up at midnight to screaming. (laughs) <laughs> not sure what's going on. Um, but instead, you know, for us, we, we have this good thing of, you know, maybe we're not staying up till midnight, probably Anna and I aren't either, but we're looking forward to saying, what's, what's the good that God can do in this coming year, and where can I be better? And so this wish for us to be, for grace and peace to be ours in fullest measure is the apostles' hope for us, um, for these um, Christians that are chosen by God, that are spread throughout uh, Asia, And so we're going to look at five takeaways we can take from this passage, five lessons that we should bring into 2024 um, with this positive view of experiencing Christ and Christ's work. So our first lesson is going to be grace and peace come from knowing Christ and his work. Um, Grace and peace come from knowing Christ and his work. Let's read um, three uh, through five, and then we'll sort of dive into it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So if our first lesson here is grace and peace come from knowing Christ and his work. Um, This whole three verses is just praising God for what he's done on our behalf. Verse three uses a very stark word, right? It's uh, the, the, the word that jumps off the page is that God has caused us to be born again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God has caused us to be born again through Jesus' ultimate miracle. The best thing that's ever going to happen to you has been done on your behalf. It's been done for you. Not only do we have life because of Jesus' work through the resurrection, but it's been affected for us. God has made a way and he's snatched you out 
of darkness, out of the fire. You know, we had it in verse 1 that we were chosen. We have it here in verse 3 that God has caused us to be saved. And so God is doing good works on our behalf. So grace and peace comes to those people who recognize that the good that we have in Christ has been done for us. Not, not by a matter of our works, not a matter of boasting. It's a matter of God's love interceding in your own life for your good. So you can have grace. First of all, you have grace. That's the good news. And you should have peace because of that grace. Um, verse 4 and 5 show us that we have this living hope. And that living hope is, is a, a destiny that is certain. Verse 4, it says, To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So we have a living hope and a destiny that is certain. God ensures your future with him, and he protects your person to that ultimate end. So God is taking care of your salvation, and he's taking care of your destiny. So have grace and peace in the fullest measure, knowing that God has done it all. There's nothing um, insufficient in your salvation. There's nothing insufficient in the portion of faith or the portion of grace that he's given you. He's given you enough and he's going to safeguard your future. It's imperishable. It's not going away. There's no contingencies. There's no caveats. There's nothing that says that you can mess this up. There's nothing that says that somebody else can ruin it for you. God has got it taken care of. So we can trust in the certainty of God's choosing you and saving you for a purpose that's, that's not going away. That's good news. In our day, that's a lot of good news. Uh, our second lesson we're going to see from the following verses is certainty in Christ's work brings purpose, resilience, and joy through trials. Certainty in Christ's work brings purpose, resilience, and joy through trials. Let's read, starting in verse 6. It says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, is perishable, even though tested by the fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, these verses are, are wonderful and insightful, and I, don't, I guess I want to spend a little more time on this, is what I'm saying. I think these verses are pointing to us that a healthy Christian life is characterized by stubborn praise. A healthy Christian life is, is a life lived with stubborn praise. Verse, uh, verse six is telling us, right, that we re greatly rejoice, rejoice in this, this truth of our salvation, the certainty of it, even though for a little while we're still struggling. And it says, even though, if necessary, um, you're facing various trials. So suffering can be necessary. And it's necessary, we'll see from verse seven, to prove our faith's worth. Um, we're comforted in this verse, uh, that this, uh, this is only for a little while, right? It's, it's only for a little while. I mean, on the grand scheme of what God has planned for you, your suffering is only for just a small time. You can look up uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, and 17. It talks about our light and momentary afflictions, that on the grand scale of all that God is doing in your life, your suffering, however acute in this moment, is... It's insignificant in terms of God's plan for your existence, the story of your life and existence with him. Um, it's not to minimize uh, what you're dealing with in terms of, um, you know, how, how real it feels to us today, but it's a matter of changing our perspective and saying that God is doing something in the scale of our life and in the scale of human history that will make our suffering seem little and insignificant and short. So take heart. This isn't it. This suffering that you've been through the suffering that you're going into, the trials that the, the coming year might have, it's light and momentary. It's only for a little while. And it's necessary. It's necessary for proving the worth of your faith. Look at that in verse 7. It says, So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by the fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So suffering is necessary to prove our faith's worth. It's necessary to refine it, just like gold is sort of, you get the ore and you melt down and you crush it, and then you get some value out of it. That's valuable. That goes through refining. To get the best out of it, it needs to be burned. It needs to be crushed. 
to get the best out of our faith, which is imperishable. Um, verse 4 talks about our inheritance is imperishable compared to gold here, which is called perishable. Um, it's worth so much more, and it's going to take a similar kind of crushing, a similar kind of burning and refining. Um, a kilo bar of gold is about the same footprint as my phone here. It's not very big. It's just obviously a little heavier. It's about 35 ounces. A kilo bar of gold, about as big as this. Anybody have a guess to how much that's worth? So, 4,500, three grand, $60,000 for this much gold. It's crazy. Well, of course, of course we're, we're also dealing with, uh, you know, gold is at historic highs, but even in historic highs, your faith is worth more than gold when purified, when its worth is proven through trials. And so Christian life, um, Christianity, Christ's work brings purpose and resilience and joy through trials because it's proving to us the worth of our faith. And then the end of verse 7, it says, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result. So this part, be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. To whom? What are the, the proving of our faith, it results in praise and glory and honor to whom? Is it to us? At the revelation of Christ, it proves valuable to Christ. The testing and the proving of your faith, it proves valuable to Christ at his revelation. Um, really, it honors Christ. The value of your faith is, is shown good and valuable and worthwhile because it withstands trials. The healthy Christian life is one of stubborn praise. It honors Christ at his revelation because it's been tested. It's been stress tested. It's been, it's been through it. And so Christ is honored at his revelation because good men and women living simple lives before the Lord, loving him in daily obedience, honor him and show the value of their faith um, because they've, they've walked with him through it all, through thick and thin, through loss and through gain. They've loved God and it's worth more to them than gold. So remember that, right? Remember that Christ has chosen you to go through suffering and it's necessary. It's necessary for your own gain and it's necessary, of course, for his glory. And so as much as it still pains us, we can keep that in perspective. It's light, it's momentary, it's only for a little while, but it's gonna bring eternal glory and it's gonna bring ultimate value, not only to our own experience of who Jesus is, but to the glory it brings him at his revelation. Verse eight and uh, verse eight sort of shifts its perspective here to that like defining that value. It's not just a value that's based on evidence of of getting to see Christ. It's actually uh, it's a faith that loves Christ even though you've never seen him. It says this in verse eight. Um, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not uh, see him now, uh, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice. In, uh, with joy, with, sorry, with joy inexpressible and full of glory, uh, obtaining to the outcome of your faith and salvation of your souls. So our, our, our getting back to our point here, that, that joy is purposeful, like, sorry, suffering brings purpose. Our lived experience ought to be one that aims for inexpressible joy, being filled with glory, because faith achieves its end. It always brings about the salvation. Um, faith always achieves its outcome in salvation. And so believing in Christ, even though we have not seen him, I think this is a, a real big compliment from Peter. You know, a man who did see God, um, a man who did falter in his faith, even though he did see Jesus. When he was restored, you know, asked, he was asked, do you love me three times? Just like he denied Jesus three times, he did believe and he did love Jesus. But he's complimenting those of us who haven't seen him and saying, you love him even though you haven't seen him. And so your joy should be inexpressible um, and you should be full of God's like just glorying in the Lord. And so I wanna remind us here that as much as we look forward to the next year and we might have goals and I, I personally have savings goals and things like this, that our tendency sometimes to, to dip back into a health and wealth theology can be, can be, can be dangerous. There can be a hazard there. 
health and wealth theology will demand that faith will bring about sight. That if you have enough faith, you will get the money, you will get the healing, you will get the health. You will have more of what you're looking for. But the gospel truth insists that believing without seeing brings joy and salvation, even through and especially because of suffering, because it's ability to prove the worth of our faith. It shows the ultimate value of that intangible, of loving a God who you cannot see, but you cannot deny. So our third lesson here, going to start in verse, um, verse 10, is one we really need as well. Um, the third lesson is we can be confident in Christ's sovereignty over history. His sovereignty over history, let's look at history in terms of past and future, how he's unfurling the human story. We can be confident in Christ's sovereignty over history. It's oftentimes um, in our uh, dislike of, you know, corporate America or political America or, you know, the UN or whatever, we can have narratives that sort of say, well, there's a bunch of terrible guys at the heart of this that are Satan worshipers and they're, they're, bringing, they're bringing the whole system down. Well, maybe or maybe not, but Christ is sovereign over the course of human history. And we're gonna see this in verse 10 through 12. It says, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, in these things which you now have been announced, which now have been announced to you, uh, through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things to which angels long to look. So the best of the best, God's prophets, that were forth telling the coming of Christ, even the angels, even the angels were curious about how God was going to work out this salvation that now you and I have received. So from eternity past, God has been working out his redemptive history that we sort of get to experience that has actually been realized in the person of Jesus for us. Old Testament prophets, they made careful searches and inquiries, wanting to know just how exactly God was going to bring about his glory. Even the angels we're not quite sure how exactly this was going to work, and God has brought it about for your benefit. Notice it talks about the fact that these things have been preached to you. It's the gospel preached to you in verse 12 um, that these people had been curious about. So Jesus is the satisfaction of prophetic hopes, angelic hopes, and it was all because God had his thumb on the scale affecting how history was going to happen for your benefit. And so we need to remember, as we're looking into, you know, another year of, of honest, I mean, things just not going how they ought to. Things not going how we hope they will be, uh, politically, economically, whatever. Uh, trust me, I'm on your side here, like, it, things aren't how they should be. <laughs> but we need to recognize that God is sovereign over history. The salvation we know today is the good that God has planned for our generation, and it is the good that he's trying to affect to the rest of the nations, to the rest of those people who are lost, who are destined to be with him. He is affecting human history to save those people that are his, those people that he has chosen. So human history will continue to disappoint, except for the fact that God is getting exactly what he wants out of it. He's getting those people that are called to him, and he's snatching them out of the fire, bringing them into his kingdom. And so things have to go the way they're going to go. And he knows how bad they're going to get. And he knows just how good it's going to be in the end because he's saving those people that are called to him. So we need to rem remind ourselves that there is a hope in the closing of human history. You'll see it. You see it in verse 5, verse 7, and verse 13, the one that we're just about to read, that the story ends, it ends well. The, you, you mentioned the word, uh, in my version, it's, a, uh, it's revelation, the revelation of Christ. Um, the Greek word, apocalypsis. We're supposed to have hope in the coming of Christ. It's not, it's not all fear and doom and gloom. It's hope, knowing that there is good, there's a good end of the story. If you look at, um, at theater, you sort of have comedies and tragedies. Tragedies, they end tragically. Comedies, it, does anybody know sort of how they typically end? They, they end, well, they end tragic. <laughs> they end happy. They end in a wedding. 
Well, the Bible ends in a wedding. It's coming to a good end. All the terrible atrocities that we're yet to experience, all the disappointments and the human failure, it all ends in a wedding. Christ is going to be married to his bride. The revelation of Christ is a good thing, a thing to hope in, a thing to look forward to. And, uh, and we need to trust him as we see the day drawing near. Let's be people of faith and courage saying, yes, things aren't how they should be, but there's a God that's bringing about good through this and you can be a part of it. And so that's our third lesson. We can be confident in Christ's sovereignty over history. Our fourth lesson is going to be God desires your personal holiness. Um, you're going to see this in verse 13. Join me there. It says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the end of the revelation of Christ. So we're supposed to fix our hope on the revelation of Christ, right? That's a good thing. Um, uh, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts, which were uh, yours in ignorance. But like ho the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior because, is it, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. The most basic Christian calling, um, regardless of your gifting, is a call to holiness. So if God has caused your salvation, if you were chosen by the Father, if the, you were brought into that salvation by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, if you're in the living hope that was achieved for you in the resurrection of Jesus, we did nothing to affect our salvation. So the call to holiness here is the effect of, of what God caused in you. God caused your salvation. He brought you into his kingdom. And so we respond through living in holiness. It's the most basic Christian calling. We were told basically to live a holy life with three points in verse 13. Prepare your minds for action. As much as we're talking about God's sovereignty and choosing us today, we don't want to be the frozen chosen. It's not, well, God chose me and so, well, to hell with the rest of them. <laughs> it's, it's that we were chosen and we were saved to serve. We were saved with a purpose. You can look at Ephesians 2.10. that talks about you were God's handiwork, chosen in advance with good works that God had in mind for you to do. We are saved with a purpose, every single one of us. You are saved to be called to action, to keep your minds ready for action. And then we're told to keep sober in spirit. It's our job to try to minimize any kind of intermingling influence that we might have from the world. We're supposed to be men and women set apart. We're supposed to be specialized and focused on God's leadership. And then we're supposed to fix our hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Christ. We should be spiritualized. We should not be secularized. We should be spiritualized. We should be a bit odd, okay? We should have a completely religious worldview and human experience. And even though we should be a bit odd, that should be a bit we should be refreshing because who on earth has hope? Who, who on earth has hope? Be the person that hopes in what Christ is doing. Be the person that has such a confidence in the reality of God that you are the person that stands out and shines like stars in the universe as I would talk about in Philippians. That if, you, if you're just the person that's not gonna complain, you will stand out like stars shining in the universe. So fix your hope completely on the grace of Christ that's being brought to you when Jesus comes back. And then verse 14 says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. All of us, God caused us to be born again. You know, John 3, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. That, that born again, it, I mean, it's it, just as good of an image as you can get. There was an old you. And those old lusts that you've been saved from, you need to be, you need to be, I mean, if you were saved from something, now act like you were saved from something. Like, that's the good news. That's part of the good news is the fact that we were saved out of something and that we can now resist it. That we are not, we are not pressed into the mold of our own, our old sins. Um, the old us doesn't have to have a bearing on who we are today. Those old lusts, those former patterns of life, well, we've been made new. And so we're not supposed to be conformed to those former things. But in verse 15, it says, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. We have grace and peace 
by knowing the work of Christ and living accordingly. Our holiness is always in reference to God's holiness. It's always in reference to his. It's not our own holiness. It's saying we've been made new. My holiness, my goodness is gonna reflect God's goodness. And the more I can reflect that, the better off I am, both for my own benefit and certainly for yours. Otherwise, if I'm just having my way, it's not very fun for anybody. Um, So verse 17 through 19 is really good. Um, And let me just check my time here. We got time, we got time. Okay, so it's gonna dive into this idea of holiness, of personal holiness, and in view of the Father, right? It says, if you address the Father, uh, if you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time, which you, during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from the futile way of life inherited uh, from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So wrapping and sort of tying together our ideas is that God has accomplished our salvation for us, that the salvation that we have and the hope that we have in it, it's imperishable, our destiny is certain, and God is good and he's been sovereign over his creation to bring about our salvation. And so we've been called to be holy. And so he's saying you're you're living your life before the Father. Your life is lived to the audience of one. God who's called you. And so you're living before him. It's all been done for you. And he tells us and reminds us to live our life. He says in fear. Conduct yourselves in fear during your time and stay on earth. Knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from the futile way of life inherited to you from your forefathers. There was a holiness that was sort of a token holiness before Christ. The, the, the goodness that was given in the name of God, um, was, was notorious for just sort of being for show. But given the transcending worth of Jesus, our conduct should transcend the holiness that was rendered to God before Jesus. So given how great a salvation we have, our holiness and the pattern of our lifestyle should be so much greater, so much more authentic, so much more um, a part of who we are and not just our, our culture, but a part of my own set of motivations, that if I've been born again and given the great cost of Christ's blood, surpassing the value of gold or silver, um, it's just time to live my life for God. It's time to live my life before him because we're reminded from our previous verse that trials test and prove the value of our faith. So it's, we've, we've already established maybe twice, maybe three times so far, that God has done everything for your salvation that your holiness is a a matter of, well, God caused it, so it's the effect of what God's caused in your life. But we're reminded to live a life that's worthy of what we've been given. It's not that you're earning something, it's, it's the fruit, it's not the root of your salvation. But given the great salvation you have, live it up, dig in, that's your identity, that's who you ought to be. So verse 20 through 21 it's going to talk about how the fact that Christ came for your sake and we, we, we believe in God and, and this is going to be evidenced through our holiness. It says in, um, uh, in verse 20, it says, for, we have, uh, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. This is Jesus. He was fore- foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. This is, again, getting to the fact that God has orchestrated our salvation Jesus, he wasn't just, he didn't just pop into existence in the, the story of Christmas. He's this eternal son of God. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he's appeared in the present time for you. That should give us just a sense of significance that Jesus came for you. This is personal. This isn't saying he came for the human race. He didn't come for your neighbor down the street. He came for you. And so, we should live with fear knowing that God has, has orchestrated all this for us and so we ought to live up to it to the best of our ability. Um, it says, uh, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers of God who raised him from the dead and gave 
glory, uh, gave him glory so that the faith and hope, so that your faith and hope are in God. So God has done all this for you. He's given you a faith and hope because of what he's accomplished for you. And our final lesson here, given all these things, I love how Peter wraps this up and what he brings us back to. It's going to be an outward orientation, not one of selfishness, but if your faith is legitimate and founded in the right things, if you've been born again, if you love God's word, what are you gonna do? You're gonna love God's people. Our final lesson for 2024 and one we should think on and hope on and pray for is that the obedient, born of God, the lovers of God's word, love God's people. It's our job to love God's people. Those people who are born of God, who love God's word, love God's people. Look at verse 22. Since you have in obedience, uh, since you have in obedience to the, to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart, for you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. So we've worked out our, we're going to work out our obedience. It's going to bring about a sincere love for the brethren, a fervent love from the heart. Because, why? We've been born again, not with a perishable seed, but with the imperishable seed of God's word. If you love God's word, if you're walking with him, you will be brought to love God's people. It will bring you into a sincere love for God's people. I'm an introvert like many of the other introverts around here. I like my alone time. And sometimes loving others costs me something. Spending time with others takes some effort. Um, investing in relationships can be uncomfortable and inconvenient. It can cost you time. It can cost you money. It, can t- it definitely cuts into your free time. A sincere love for God and for his word will absolutely bring about a sincere love for God's people. And so that's where I think, I, I don't want to end this. I mean, that's where, where Peter has brought us to the end of this conversation. Given all that God has done for us, given your rebirth, your, your new life in, in God, given that seed of God's word and our love for it, it will absolutely bring about a love for other Christians. Um, and that, that is, is, is his will. I mean, after the call to holiness, what's his ultimate end? That we would love each other. Because we are in a religion of the God of love. Because the best of his commandments is love. Because the evidence of being disciples, his disciples, is that we would love one another. Um, Our religion best expressed is expressed not through snappy intellect, not um, not through chastity alone, it's not through... Um, religious tokenism, it's absolutely expressed in its best as we love each other because of how we love God and how we've experienced his love in us. Let's pray that God would give us an authentic love for each other to love one another better, to love that person on the fringe, to love that person that we might not understand, that we might not befriend if it wasn't for God's calling in our life to love sincerely those who he's laid his life down for. Christ died for them. Love them well. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you've brought about another year. Um, and we do thank you for the things that you've brought us um, through, the, the things that you've helped us survive, God. And we do have many hopes and fears, um, both, both personal and societal, for these coming times, God. But we trust in your goodness and the work you've achieved for us and the work you're going to achieve for your own glory to win people to you. God, we want to be a part of it and help us to live lives that are worthy of the calling that we've received, um, that truly come to grasp with all that we have from you, God, that we, would, um, that we would stand out and we would be strange, but we would be strange in our hope, strange in our love, um, that we would be strange in the experience that we have um, authentically loving you for a Christ that's, uh, that's died for us, that's called us to love one another. God, equip us. Help us, um, help us in our weakness, help us in our faithlessness to, to have just more trust in you, more certainty in you, and for that to just sort of seep into the rest of our experience, um, that this life would be lived for you. God, help us to be focused on you this year um, for your glory. Amen.
right, let's stand and sing, lead on, O King, eternal. 659 in your hymnal. of the Holy Spirit and we ask for your spirit to lead us as we leave and help us to be uh, useful to you and in, in um, the way that we conduct our lives and what we say uh, even today and, and this week and this new year. Thank you again for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.